So we had three people join God's family this week. Let's give God an applause for that. So God did some fantastic thing. And then I thought it was four just last night. Um, Jeff Facebooks me and says, Pastor Sam, Cindy joined the family. And I was like, what? I thought she already joined the family. And I was like, and I, I, I was getting really excited. Like my heart was like leaping in joy. And, and then I realized I went to the page where Jeff goes, welcome to the family. She got a MacBook Air. And I, I was like, oh. So, you know, I was like, wow. I was, and so I told Cindy, I was like, well, I guess you got saved twice. <laughs> but um, speaking of families, um, in just 26 days, my wife and I would have been married for 10 years. And um, I know I say that a lot, but a decade just seems, I don't know, seems uh, long. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I just want to say that reflecting back, and let's put a picture here of what the greatest gift that God has given my life. Look at, look at Josh's yawn there. Uh, and, I, I, you know, the greatest gift I ever received in my life is, you know, my, friend, my best friend, my wife. Everybody say, aw. There you go. Just for today. And, um. Uh, and I can't, I wouldn't be able to ask for any more adventure, any more intimacy, any more companionship than the 10 years. I mean, it was wild. It was hard. It was awesome. It was, there were tears. There was laughter. It was crazy. It was amazing. And the two boys, those two munchkins, in spite of the poop, in spite of the drool, in spite of the chaos, in spite that they took over my bed, and now I go to sleep in Nathan's bed, and this happens every night, and I see stars in this room, and, and here, I'm, and I'm going to sleep at night, and I'm going, I'm sleeping in a five-year-old's bed with, with toys everywhere. I can't ask for, you know, more, you know, beautiful kids. You know, they're, they're adorable, and, you know, in a sense, in every sense of the word, you can say that we're almost, can seem like the perfect family. Everything seems great, and you know, more than I ever could ask for. And I'm so grateful. But you know what? There's still not enough. You know, well, it's more than you could, per, per, you know, picture perfect. Still, there's still not enough. And you know what? They're the greatest gift. My wife is the greatest gift. My kids are the best gift. And no matter how great a gift is, it could never, ever replace the giver. Or can it? Films suggest, and especially in the early 90s, a movie called Titanic told all the women in the world. And they watched it like 10 times. And, and, you know, I went to high school. I was like, where are you going? Oh, watching Titanic. Again? I gotta find Jack. <laughs> and Titanic told a story and propelled Leonardo DiCaprio to st iconic status. And it told all the women, and, and it was global. It wasn't just the United States. It wasn't just a, a, you know, a particular culture. This romantic story swept the globe and told every single woman in the whole world that all you really need to do is find Jack. And you'll, your life will be complete. Or, or, or till more recently, the Twilight franchise told all teenagers, and those of you shameful people that like it like I do, <laughs> that all you need to do to, to be complete is to find Edward, a vampire. <laughs> or Jacob, but whatever team Edward or team Jacob you are. All you need to do is find a vampire or where it's ridiculous. And you'll find Utopia. But you know what? The numbers don't lie. The numbers are record-breaking. It's wish fulfillment. It says that all you need is the gift, and your life will make sense. And of course, we can pick on ladies because they're the sentimental type. But let's talk about men. All the ladies say amen. 
All right. And I mean, you talk about a classic show like Entourage, trashy, sexually explicit. Talk about wish fulfillment. What is uh, what, what are they selling? They're selling that in, in the end of Entourage, the whole point of it is Vince, the superstar celebrity, meets a girl for two weeks, falls in love with her and says, you're the one. You make my life complete. And the movie, the show ends with them going on a jet to an island. And, <laughs> really? And all the guys watch that, yeah! That's it! That's the gospel. That's my gospel. I just need to find that perfect girl and my life is going to be cruising on a private jet which you will never be able to afford but that's the wish fulfillment or guys will watch ESPN and watch these superstars and watch these athletes perform and and they go you you you, you the selling and the marketing is well if if you can hit it out of the park when it counts accomplishment is the way to complete your life, to get what you need. In such and such product, in such and such person, it's going to bring utopia. You don't need to be a genius to realize the marketing dollars, the media, the culture is shaped by wish fulfillment. Because like Solomon says, eternity is set within our hearts. Pascal says, the heart is created for something bigger than it knows. So we are in a state of ambivalence and can basically conflict most of our life. The tension for release. And we go, we need this or we need that. You know, when you look at Jesus, what Jesus says in the gospel. Not any other world religion. You know, I'm not here to talk about principles. I'm not here to talk about if you pick up this lesson. I'm here to talk about what Jesus said in John 10. 10. And Jesus says, I'm speaking about this desire that you have. That you all have. Within you, deep within. This wish fulfillment for utopia. And it sounds a lot like paradise. It sounds a lot like the Garden of Eden. Except that the Lord is not in it. And Jesus says, I've come to give you life. In life to the full. And a lot of Christians and a lot of people hear Jesus say this in John 10 and go, oh, Jesus, come. Jesus has come to give me life. And so when, when you are in different ages of life, you go, well, Jesus is going to give me this girl, or Jesus is going to give me this job, or Jesus is going to give me this type of husband, and Jesus is going to give me this type of picture, and this and that, and now wish fulfillment goes to the gospel, and the gospel is basically there to fulfill that utopian idea that we're longing for in the heart. And people totally miss what Jesus is saying. Jesus comes in John 10 and says, I've come. Tell someone, I've come. Now yell it to them, I've come. No, tell them, you don't get it. <laughs> you don't get it. I've come. You go, okay, you've come to fulfill, my, to fulfill my wishes. Jesus goes, no, I've come to give you life to the full. To give you life and life to the full. What is he saying? He's saying, it's not a product, it's me. I've come. I am the fullness of your ambivalence and conflict. Me. Wait, that's not what Jesus, that's not what ESPN said. That's not what Prada said. That's not what the picture is. That's not what culture says. No, Jesus goes, I'm talking, I'm not talking about your apathy. I'm talking about your passion. I'm talking about within you. I'm talking about I've come to fulfill that desire. You're looking for me. And Jesus says, I've come to give you Fountains of living water in John 4. And here's the problem, folks. As we go through Lent, as we fast, and as we seek the Lord, as we feast on Christ, you see, so, so many of us are so used to substitutes for relief of the tension. And we call this the less wild lovers before in, the, in you know, previous sermons and talks. We're so used to alleviating the tension for desire. 
but we never really go to where the gospel says life really is. And this is the encounter this woman has with Jesus. She has this whole classic case of wish fulfillment. She believes such and such a guy will bring utopia to her life, but it doesn't. And this encounter with Jesus changes everything. So a question I want to answer today is how do we get this life Jesus is talking about? This full life that will quench the itch. You know, St. Augustine said before he was converted to Christ that he tried to scratch that lust and have your imagination. It was pretty back bad then, back then in paganism. He tried to scratch that itch, that desire. Today, I want to talk about how that desire can be quenched. And nothing could quench it, Jesus says, except me. And here, a lot of us are going to look at this text and be like, okay, who am I in the story? And we're all the women. You're like, no, I don't struggle with, I don't have five husbands. <laughs> That's not, I don't have those problems. No, it's just, it's just an analogy. S- stick with it. So let's go to the text. And look what happens. And everyone knows this story. And Jesus says to her, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, which is ironic, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. She's like a blonde. (laughs) And the well is deep. I don't get it. And Jesus is like, "Mm, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? And remember, Jacob is the, basically his name is changed to Israel. This is the, the line of all of the Jews. So she has an heritage of this meaning of life and God and faith and says, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. So Jesus here, if you look at verse four of John chapter four, well, I read this like a hundred million times and it ministers to me every single time because I find myself within it. And it doesn't matter if I've got if I've, I've accomplished something great. Or it doesn't matter if I get more kids, hopefully. One more, just one more. <laughs> and um, if I get, you know, a house, if I get, you know, a professorship, if I am invited to something influential, you know, because what ESPN tells me is I need to accomplish more and I will feel happier. But I want to be honest with you as a pastor and just as a man and as a son and as a husband that it doesn't matter how much I've experienced in life, I come back to this well. I'm thirsty again. I'm thirsty again. It's not enough. And you know what? The only place for me anyway that I come back to is Jesus meeting me at the well. He goes, Sam, are you chasing that again? Stop beating that dead cat. I feel that Jesus say that. I'm like, you're clever, Jesus. You know? And I come to this, I come to this text, folks, and Jesus is so intentional, and I don't know where you are with me, but Jesus is so intentional about the desire within our hearts, the ambivalence we feel, the tension we feel for the desire in us and all the places we're looking. If you look at verse 4 before we come back to verse 11, Jesus says he had to go to Samaria. And for those of you that have been with me know that geographically speaking, this is a Samaritan woman and Jesus is fully Jewish. Samaritan is at the time of the Assyrian Empire when Israel was split they became a mixed race. So in, in terms of racism, the Jews would never associate with Samaritans. They would never go through Samaria. They would cross the Jordan River, which is really out of the way. 
And they would totally avoid it, to avoid these people. So when Jesus says in verse 4, he had to go to Samaria, geographically he didn't have to go to Samaria, he never does. When he says he had to go to Samaria, he's talking about it was a divine appointment. Tell someone, you're right now sitting at a divine appointment. You're like, what? What does that mean? Meaning Jesus understands the curse of humanity. He understands the ambivalence and the conflict that we feel inside that, that cannot, that's, cannot scratch that itch, no matter what product, what person. Many times, why relationships don't work is because we want the woman to be God, and she definitely isn't. And my woman is great, but she's definitely not Jesus. Sometimes like, wow, you're awesome. And then, oh, yeah, you're, you're not Jesus. And sometimes the pressure for a man in a relationship is so great because you want him to be Jesus. You want him to be God. You want him to fulfill all your desires. Dude, he's a dude. Dudes are dumb. Most of the time, we're slow. Eat. <laughs> Move. <laughs> Move out of the way. I mean, I mean, I mean, seriously, it, people don't cannot, people are not happy <clears throat> most of the time because you have you have too high expectations of people. You know, 60 Minutes did a survey of the happiest people on the planet. And it was surprisingly a country no one expected to have. And I have a friend there, and you know what? I spent time with him. He's my great Viking friend from Denmark, the flattest place on the earth. 60 Minutes said they're the happiest people. And, and, they want, and so all the people were like, why? Why are the Danes, the, are they the best looking? You know, is it because they're Vikings? Is it because they, have, they, they make great beer? You know, I mean, what, what is it? And 60 Minutes discovered that they have low expectations. And then, you know, the host was like uh, interviewing a Danish man. You know, once America finds out that Denmark is the happiest place on the earth, a lot of people are going to move there. And he goes, yeah, probably. I'm sure they'll be disappointed. <laughs> he has low expectations. So they, they, so they don't have this classic wish fulfillment utopian idea because they think a beverage is a beverage. A beer is a beer. It does what it does. A human being is a human being. You know, one of my favorite cultural poets and rock stars of all time, Bruce Springsteen, says this. Everybody has a hungry heart. Now, Jesus here cannot help anyone with apathy. And this is why the enemy tries to destroy us and beat us down in life so that we just go, you know what, I'm not going to care anymore. Because apathy is the opposite of passion, and apathy, God can't even help apathy. Apathy is what hell is. It's a place where nothing is. But Jesus is meeting the woman here, like me and like you, in a divine appointment. I don't know where you're trying to draw your life from today. I'm sure you know, and the Holy Spirit knows. But he's here. He knows that your, your, hung, your heart is hungry. He goes, I'm here. Let's battle. Let's meet. And look what she says. You have to catch this real carefully in this text before we move on to the next thing. You see, the woman says to Jesus, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well? A lot of times, wish fulfillment is passed down from our family and from our tribe. And as the world becomes more connected, a lot of times our family no longer passed down our value. It's actually our friends and our culture, the people we want to be accepted by, tribalism in a sense. And you know what? Those values are passed down to us. 
And you know what? You have to identify that because that's what you value the most. Because she d- doesn't know any better. She goes, this is the well I always drew my life from. Right? Parents say this all the time when people get married. If you want to be happy, get money. Get a lot of money. Because financial stress, studies show it's the greatest fear, greatest problem. Right? You, need, you marry someone rich. <laughs> How many people heard this from your parents? <laughs> marry someone rich. And you know, and, and, and parents will look you know, down on people, oh, and this is the only time it really matters, right? Oh, you know, it's, it's not like you can go to, a, you know, a parent or a dad, if, like, for example, if my son was going and asking someone's hand for a marriage, I mean, I, I've done this, and it's really high pressure. I asked uh, my father-in-law, you know, can I marry your daughter? And he was like, what? For two hours, he was like, what about these pancakes? You want to marry these pancakes? I mean, I mean, he was just like dodging me. The, pr- the pressure is there. So why, why, why we draw life from status and looks? I mean, because you know what? You know the only time people are really superficial is when you bring someone to your family. And the family's like, oh, he's not good looking enough. I want good looking kids. I mean, what? When is, when is this all these little thing, nitpicking things matter? Well, it's... Because we want to be, we want people to be like, "Wow, that's a great couple." We want, oh, that's part of our family. We want, we want this, and it's this sense of value being passed down. And you know what? I'm telling you, it does not matter. Most people that are married and have kids, they, you go, "Are you happy?" <laughs> Ask a mom that has three kids, a beautiful house, and a beautiful husband. Like they can't even sleep together because of the kids. Are you happy? Uh, yeah. Lies. Why? Because, let me just tell you, everything, in, everything that's a gift from God, and the Bible says, that, you know, it's from the, the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift from God, but it does not, it cannot replace God. Cannot. The haunting, let me, let me just tell you, I hate the haunting. Sometimes I think the haunting is a craving for a Boston cream donut, and I confuse it, and I'm being dead, dead serious. But after I eat the donut, the haunting is still there. I'm like, darn. Why is it still there? I thought it was just Boston cream. I know, and the Lord goes, that's not it. That's not it. Why are you still hungry? So, how do you find this life that Jesus is talking about? Well, first lesson we learn from this text is what? We have to what? Stop confusing with what? Goods with what? God. The classic wish fulfillment marketing scheme, and it works, folks. And it, in, in the, the narratives that we come up with, the perfect picture, it's in our heads. And I want to say this. One of the reasons why we're always disappointed is because we confuse good or the good things with God. Right now, there are a bunch of things in our life that's getting in the way of coming to God. And it's the goods. We confuse the goods being God, and it will never satisfy. So, let's move on. Let's move down. And you go, well, so Pastor Sam, then what do I do? Are you just telling me that my life's going to (laughs) suck? You're just telling me I'm just not, I should be a Dane. I should move to Denmark. And um, just be like, well, nothing's going to really be good, so whatever. You know, be apathetic. That's not what I'm saying. My whole argument. For this text, for everything I shared, is to let you know. You go, so Pastor Sam, what do you do when the haunting is there? The ambivalence is there. The conflict is there. The tension is there. And you try everything, and it does not scratch that itch. And you know what? You might think that this is crazy. It's really under our nose. And Jesus talks about this in this passage. This is why we worship. You're like, what? You mean sing songs? 
I hate singing. This is why I worship. And you go, I don't like worship. I think it's corny. You know, some people come to me and go, I think worship is like corny. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> like, oh, you know, I've got to sing these mushy songs. I'm like, but you're mushy. Oh, well, you know, I don't know. I'd rather listen to rap music. <laughs> it's like, what? Because people have this idea of worship being old ladies singing hymns. Because they have nothing better to do on Sunday. They come and go, oh, yeah, you know, I'm being good. And I'm being a good person. Let me tell you, the, that picture of worship is demonic. Expression of what we want to delight in is worship. People worship love. People worship money. People worship influence. It's everywhere. It's simple. It's what you exalt in it, what you worship. Worship is not singing. It's expressing. It's expressing the deepest desire within the heart. So, this is why I worship, because a lot of people go, oh, yeah, God. I just need God. What does that mean, I just need God? Well, what is that even supposed to mean? It means to express your love and the goodness of God. David says, taste the Lord, for he is what? Good. How many people during the week were like, you, you just aim someone or text someone, God is good. How many people do that? No, why not? Uh, I text people, A, K, bye, hi. Why, why don't we say that God is good? Because we're not expressing the love and the goodness and the character of God. We don't do that because we think having God is just like having God here and be like, what do I do? We have to witness and experience and go to him and experience the goodness of God, the Bible says. The Bible is the only religious book that gives a challenge that's hard. It says, taste the Lord for he is good. Come to me, I'm the fountain of living water. Jesus says, here, I'm going to give you living water and you will never thirst again. It's an invitation. It's a challenge. So, Jesus here answered, Everyone who, what, drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a what? A spring of water welling to eternal life. How many people ever felt joy where your stomach like was bubbling up and you started laughing? I felt that. I remember at my wedding when we were dancing to our song. That was the only dancing we did. It was a religious wedding. <laughs> In Nyack, they teach us not to dance to anything. Back then, anyway. And, uh, and um, we were, the song came on, and we had our first dance. You know? And, and it was our song. You know? It, it was the moment when everyone waits, everything is consummated, and, you know... We were both dashing, and I was much thinner. I look at the video. You know, I look at the wedding video sometimes, folks, and be like, wow, Sam, you are awesome back then. <laughs> back then. Still awesome now. But, I mean, you know, we were there, and, um, and I'm telling you this. Like, you know, we, were, we, we danced to this moment, and you know what? I felt this joy welling up within the soul. Because we were letting everyone know, that's my gal. I was like, she's my wife. You know, for I think for the first eight months, I kept saying, that's my wife. Because she was mine. And I could express it in the romance of it. Here, if you read this passage carefully, look what Jesus is saying. I don't think a lot of people, honestly, to tell you, and if, we, if I can be, can I be honest? I, you know, I feel like preaching today. I don't know why. It might be the coffee or the Boston cream I ate this morning because I'm not fasting today. And um, look at this. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. 
You see, when you're disappointed with everything and everyone, apathy comes. And you go, you know what? I don't think that's true. That's just wish fulfillment. And you become cynical. The danger is that the soul should persuade itself that it is not hungry. It can only persuade itself of this by lying. So you see, her, her conflict and her tension is, you know what? I don't want to open up this river of emotion and disappointment and tension. I know, I know, I know the Christ, the Messiah, the redemptive one, he is going to come one day and explain everything to us. Then Jesus declares this. I want everyone to read this with me. What's he say? I, the one speaking, the pronoun, tell someone to you. I am he. I mean, you want to stop all this religious activity. You want to stop all this running, cycling, spirituality, piety, self-righteousness, rebellion, whatever it is. And you want to get down to the core of really resolving the tension. You have to come to Jesus, not religion. It's not about being good and filling the list and coming to church and tithing and going to small group and praying and joining Bible group and joining small group and joining the media team and joining this, the arts and craft team and making birds over there. I mean, it's, it's sorry, it's not that because you know what? You can be really dutiful. You can be really someone that's loyal to people and to God and you can do it out of obligation. Soon or later, it will run out. You'll stop tithing because other things are more important. You'll stop joining. You'll stop serving because you cannot control the heart. It can't be loyal to church. It can't be loyal to people. If you're going to survive and thrive in faith, it has to be you have to meet Jesus. And you have to sh be shut in with him. And you have to have a song with him. And you have to have a romance with him. Because without it, you're done. You will fail. I will fail. It won't be enough. Less wild lovers will come. It is the way it is. The human heart cannot be contained. It has to be fulfilled. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I am he. Stop this nonsense, he says. Stop this nonsense of these men. Stop this nonsense of such and such product. I am he. So how do we know that she got the message? That she stopped the nonsense of searching. She didn't give up. And she gave and found him and drank from this cup of living water. Oh, verse 28. And this is my favorite part of John 4, verse 28, because it's really why I believe in the name 180 Church and why we named it 180. It's still my dream, it's still everything within me, what I want to be as a follower of Christ. Verse 28 is everything what really the invitation of the gospel is. In verse 20 it says what? Read it with me. What's the first word? A then. A time. A moment. A decision came. Leaving her water jar, the place that she was taught to draw life from her whole life, Right? It's men. It's accomplishments. It's status. She left the jar. The woman went back into town and said to people, folks, today could be a divine appointment for all of us of not play, not, not play religiosity or religion or principle. Today could be a moment where we are the woman in the well and we leave our wells behind and just take Jesus with us. Because let me tell you, honestly, as a pastor, as a man, as a husband, as a father, all things in life are great. So you're going to still be thirsty. Today, drink and taste the Lord is good. Because when you meet Jesus and you drink and feast on him, that's when you do radical things for the kingdom of God.
because you love him and you follow him. And that's why you love the church. And that's why you give sacrificially. And that's why you become a missionary. And that's why you do crazy things. That's why I'm here. I love him. That's why I worship him. Stand and pray together. So, as you stand, second principle. See that when you preach, you forget the point. How do you get this living water? Amen. <laughs> Minus the O from good in your life. Because what you're looking for is what? Everybody say it. No, no, exclamation point. God. You're looking for God. Everyone on this planet, the Bible says, is looking for God. They just don't know it. But eternity is set in our hearts, folks. We need to meet Jesus. Will you lift your hands with me? I want to pray for you right now. Father, I want to pray for those of us that are pious and religious first. Legalism has a strong propensity to go for a long time because our reward is really approval from our leaders, from our people. And we attain some type of status of acceptance. Oh, but it will fail. And it always has. Folks, don't be loyal to people. And I know that sounds bad, but you know what I mean? Ultimately, it's a hyperbole. It, don't be loyal to religion. Don't be loyal to principles. When it says drink from the fountain of living life, when Jesus says this well, when you drink from this water, he's talking about I am he. I am the one you're looking for. Encounter Jesus. Find him for yourself. And then worship him. Everything else will fall into place. For those of us that are seeking for life, and you know what? You're not a believer. You're seeking. Jesus is meeting all of us like that. And you have that tension. Come to Jesus. Let him speak to your soul. Find out who he is for yourself. So as you lift your hands to the Lord with me, I want to pray that we become a people that really become loyal to Jesus. Become that encounter Jesus. And worship Jesus for he is good. And encounter him and know him and know his voice and know his heart. And when we get a pristine picture of Jesus, Oh, all that religious stuff will be a piece of cake. We're not going to do it because we have to. We're going to do it because we want to. And passion is something everyone knows that cannot be stopped. And I pray today that you would fall in love and see and find who Jesus is. So I'm going to pray right now. We're going to sing this song, Draw Me Close. And I really feel this in my spirit, people, that Jesus is meeting some people today. And I believe this with all my heart. And I, God has given me a vision of verse 28 of John 4. There will be people as we declare the beauty and the love and the excellence and the majestic power of Jesus. Oh, there are going to be people that leave their jar and drink deeply from who Jesus is. And they will do things in this planet that will change the world because they have found what they're looking for. And that security and that confidence will be unshakable. And I believe 
they will do a 180. Draw me close. Let's make this our prayer. Let's lift our hands. Let's make this our worship. Draw me close to you, God. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Never let me go. We have to lay down religion today. else would do. No one else will do. There's nothing else. Because nothing else can take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. For those of you that need to find God, go to Him right now. You're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. You're all. Lord, we want to come before you this afternoon. Father, we want to meet Jesus. And Jesus didn't say, this is the way, this is what you believe to get utopia, to be complete, to be whole. Jesus says, I'm the way. I know you've heard it said, you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to go there. No, Jesus said, no, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I've come to give you life. And this is why so many of us are so disappointed in life. Some, some of us are even disappointed in Christianity because what we were told and caught was, when I believe in Jesus, I will be happy and everything will be perfect and everything will be utopia. Because we took the gospel and said, oh yeah, well, Jesus is supposed to give me my wish fulfillment. He, he's, he wants to give me life to the full. And so we go, well, where are the adjectives to full? How, how will my life be full? And then we totally miss the statement, I've come. Me. <laughs> Believing in Jesus and looking to Him is not going to make our life perfect, no. Oh, but He will be there. But no one else can. He'll be there processing through all that baggage of emotion, all the fears, all the anxiety, all the storms in life. Oh, Jesus will be the friend that we never thought we could have. Jesus will be the lover that understands the deepest part of the soul. Oh, Jesus promises that this world will not be perfect because it's in a state of war, but Jesus does promise that I will be with you and never leave you and never forsake you. I will always be with you. For you're all I want. Will you put your hands to your heart? This is what I do when I worship daily.
You're all I want. Let's just say that phrase. You're all I want. You're all I want. You're all ever needed. You're all. As you close your eyes and sing this for the last time, let's make it our prayer and seal it within our heart. Draw me close to you. Draw me close to you. Lord, we come before you this afternoon. Father, we want to fall in love and to meet the person of Christ. Everything else in Christianity will fall into place when we hinge our relationship on the person of Christ and fall in love with the beauty of Christ. Feast on Him as He nourishes the quench in our spirit for eternity, for beauty, for transcendence. Everything else then will fall into place. Then we'll get crazy people to do crazy things because love makes you do crazy things, doesn't it? And that's when it will make sense. So Lord, I pray for a community of people that meet Jesus and does it not out of obligation or loyalty to people, but they will do things that you've called them to do because they love you and will change the world as you did once before 2,000 years ago. We thank you. In your name we pray. All God's people say, Amen. Let's give God a plaf offering. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Oh, yeah. I forgot the benediction. Sorry. I'm excited today. All right. Bow your heads for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Again. This is our third service in uh, the season of Lent. And uh, again, we want to welcome you all to it.
And uh, we celebrate Lent um, because it's a time, you know, before Jesus uh, was crucified, died, and was uh, resurrected. And, you know, he paid the price for our sins. But this is a time where we fast the things that get in the way of our relationship with God. Just as uh, Jesus fasted 40 days in the desert so that he could just feast on his Father's presence. And that's what we're doing this Lent season. So if you're um, joining us in this Lent season and fasting and feasting on God's presence, that's great. And we want to, you know, just say keep going at it because a lot of people are doing it and a lot of people are really getting closer to God. And if you're just new and joining us, you know, we want to welcome you. And if you're want to get closer to God, you know, this is a great way to do it. Start fasting the things that get in the way of your uh, relationship with God so that you can really feast on his presence. Uh, we have a couple of quick announcements before we get started. And we're going to start out with... Uh, a art show that we're going to be doing on Easter Sunday. It's called uh, Portraits of New Life. You know, what we're going to do is we're going to submit, you know, photos or pictures or drawings or whatever uh, that symbolize uh, old life and new life, death and rebirth. And uh, if you want to be involved with this, you don't have to be a professional artist or anything like that, just something that touches you that symbolizes old life and new life. You can just submit it either to your small group leader or if you don't have a small group leader, you can submit it to Pastor Billy. Just try to do it the week before um, Easter. I believe that's the 24th of uh, March. So um, we want to see you know, as many pictures as we can on this. So if you feel compelled to uh, join in with this, just submit a, a couple of pictures. Our next announcement is about prayer requests. You know, sometimes there are things going on in our lives that we don't feel like we can handle on our own. And God is there to be our strength. He's there to be our, uh, our refuge. And it's just simple to easy to pray to him to say, God, I need some help on this. And one of the things that we have is our prayer request line, 5397 prayer. You can text to that, um, to that line and just, you know, say, God, this is what's going on in my life. And we have people who pray for these things so that you're not alone in whatever you're going through. So if you have something that's going on in your life, just send us a prayer text, or you could email it to prayer at 180church.tv. And when God moves in your life, you can also send a praise request so that we can all share in what God is doing in your life. Our next announcement is about tithes and offering. You know, one of the things we do here at 180 Church is we keep God in the center of everything that we have, and that does include our finances so that we can keep God's mission going. So if you're a member here at 180 Church, I want to just encourage you to remember to tithe faithfully. You can tithe either in the back at the info booth. You can tithe online at 180church.tv through PayPal. Or you can go on Chase Quick Pay and uh, send your tithe to offering at 180church.tv. And uh, as I said last week, um, tax season is on us. Uh, Andrew Rowe's been working on the tax letters for those who have been tithing faithfully last year. It is tax deductible, and it's always good to get a little money back from Uncle Sam. So uh, if you haven't gotten a letter from Andrew Rowe, just talk to him, and he'll get you set up. Our next announcement is about small groups. You know, small groups are where we get together, we meet weekly, we talk a little bit more in depth about what God is doing in our lives, what Pastor Sam spoke about in the message, and it's a great place to get more in touch with what God is saying in your life and just to the community in general. So if you're not a member of a small group, I want to encourage you to join one. We meet in Staten Island as well as in Manhattan during the week. We have groups for all different age brackets and places where people are in life. And you can just talk to Andrew Park and he'll get you set up with one. Our next announcement is about sharing the gospel. You know, we send out our uh, email every week uh, with Pastor Sam's sermon, and it's really easy. At the bottom of that email is a link where you can send it to a friend. You can forward it to a friend if you want to get them, you know, started on the journey with Christ. It's really easy. Just click on it at the bottom. And we're also on Facebook, so you can always like our page and uh, share the Facebook message through there. Uh, we have just one last announcement, and it's one that, you know, everybody really needs to hear. Next week is the beginning of daylight savings time. So that means it's, we're going ahead an hour, and we're all losing an hour of sleep. So, yeah, I know, that sucks. But uh, just make sure that you set your clocks ahead the night before, because don't say it's not going to happen, because I know I walked in an hour late one time. So just make sure that you set your clocks ahead next week. Uh, those are all of our announcements. more than it